Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Laszlo Montgomery here with another nice, flavorful, and nutritious Chinese saying for you. We're halfway through with the season. Time flies when you're having fun. Or as one might say in Chinese, Guang Yin Si Jian. Time flies like an arrow. But that is not our Cheng Yu for this time. Today, we have another swell one that comes to us straight from the Book of Jin, compiled during the Tang Dynasty. As you know, it was always the succeeding dynasty that would compile the official history of the preceding one, giving credence to the old saying that the past is what happened and history is how it's written about. Our Chinese saying for this episode is Dong Shan Zai Qi, and as we always seem to do, and for good reason, I suppose, let's break these four syllables down. Dong means east, and Shan means mountain, eastern mountain. Zai means again or once more. And qi means to rise, get up, or stand up, among other definitions. Dongshan Zai Qi, Eastern Mountain Again Rises. Well, I guess that could mean anything, so let's hop in our time machine and go back more than 16 centuries ago to the time of the Eastern Jin Dynasty, when the capital was located down in Jiankang, modern-day Nanjing. This is where the Jin royal family ended up, after getting brutally chased out of their previous capitals of Luoyang and Chang'an by the marauding Xiongnu tribes from the north. During the Eastern Jin Dynasty, there lived a scholar named Xia'an, who lived 320 to 385. He was also known as Xia Dongshan, Dongshan again, meaning Eastern Mountain. Even at a young age, Xia'an was Famous for not only his intelligence and high degree of learning, but also as a rather proficient calligrapher. As a young man, he was offered a position in the bureaucracy, reporting directly to the prime minister. This was a position in the capital that offered many opportunities for advancement in the government. But like many other intellectuals of the time, Xia'an had no desire for government work. This was a common theme throughout Chinese history the talented literatus scholar who, though eminently qualified, rejected a life in the government bureaucracy so that they may engage in the lifestyle of a traditional Chinese scholar. Despite his feelings about not wishing to go to work in the government, Xia'an finally got talked into serving as an official in the Eastern Jin government. But not long after he feigned sickness, quit his job, and moved back to his hometown in Kuaiji, now, this city of Kuai Ji, later on in 1131, during the southern Song Dynasty, was renamed Shaoxing, a city very much renowned for its scholars and literati and its wine. But Xia'an had become too famous and renowned to lead the secluded life he wished for. Upon hearing once that Xia'an was in the vicinity, the prefect of Yangzhou himself came to offer him a nice position in that city. Xia'an initially refused, but the prefect was rather persistent, and so, after plenty of arm twisting, Xia'an had no choice but to accept the offer. But not more than a month or so later, Xia'an manufactured another excuse to resign and left this government job as well. And in the years to follow, Xia'an kept dodging attempts from the government to have him serve as an official. Rather than involve himself in the bureaucracy... Xia'an lived a nice, leisurely life, writing poetry with his friends and fellow intellectuals such as Sun Chuo and Wang Xizhi. Now, these two were among the most renowned and celebrated poets, calligraphers, and literati of their day. Wang Xizhi was covered in an old China History Podcast episode number 96. He is immortalized in Chinese cultural history as perhaps... China's greatest calligrapher, and for his legendary introduction to poems composed at the Orchid Pavilion, a.k.a. the Lanting Ji Xu. Though Xia'an and his friends often toured the South, taking in China's magnificent scenery and landscapes, his home base remained a mountain called Dongshan in Kuaiji, again present-day Shaoxing, northeastern Zhejiang province. One day, as he sat on the mountain looking out over the rivers and valleys below, Xia'an sighed contentedly. 
How lucky I am to be able to lead the life of the ancient hermit Boyi. Now, Boyi was a mythical figure from the most ancient times. Meanwhile, Xie An's younger brother, Xie Wan, was rising quickly in the imperial court, doing what his older brother refused to do, serving in the government. As talented as Xie Wan was, everyone acknowledged that it was really brother Xie An who was the real genius of the two. The further up Xie Wan managed to climb, the more everyone lamented that Xie An had gone into seclusion. Seeing that Xie Wan's family was growing rich after his many promotions, Xie An's wife grew discontented with her husband's simple lifestyle. She went to Xie An and complained, Can you call yourself a great man if you keep hiding away from fame and fortune? But Mrs. Xie had no better luck than the government officials who kept trying in vain to entice Xie An to leave his perfect life of solitude and scholarship behind and to go work for the Eastern Jin Imperial Court. Not long after that, Xie Wan, as it often was, at the pinnacles of power, and he came up short in a political struggle and, as punishment, was stripped of all his titles and demoted to commoner status. This shook Xie An greatly as it reflected badly on the Xie family name. So he was determined to do something to restore the family's honor. Therefore, already 40 years old, Xie An reluctantly agreed to accept a position as a military commander under the great general Huan Wen. The day Xie An left his home in East Mountain to take up his position, many important officials came to give him a big send-off. One official joked, How many times the imperial court has tried to entice you back. We never thought we'd see the day you'd come off your high horse on East Mountain. Xie An smiled and bowed modestly at his friend's praise, and off he went to serve at his post, which he did with the expected competency. A little later on, General Huan Wen started getting imperial aspirations and was counting on Xie An's loyal support in the political struggle that was sure to happen. But Xie sided with the general's rival claimant to the throne, and for this, he earned Huan Wen's enmity. A potential showdown occurred in 373 when General Huan Wen marched on the capital, ostensibly to seize power from the Eastern Jin Emperor. At such a politically dangerous time as this, those in the capital, Jian Kang, were shaking in their boots about Huan Wen and his army seizing power. But Xie An remained as cool as a cucumber and welcomed his political rival who he had sided against in the power struggle, risking his life in the process. He convinced Huan Wen to give up these thoughts of seizing power, and as it happened, eh, this all became a moot point after Huan Wen died later that year in 373. Nothing came of this political trembler. Xie An later on took measures to break up General Huan's power base, and the political crisis was resolved. From there, Xie later went on to become the prime minister for the Eastern Jin Emperor. As prime minister, Xie An governed wisely and was lauded for his wisdom and fairness. But this time in Chinese history, late 4th century, it was anything but a peaceful and stable time. It was from the fall of the Western Jin and into the period of the 16 kingdoms. If you look at the China map of the 380s AD, you'd see the Eastern Jin only controlled the southern half of China, and the former Qin occupied the northern half. In line with most of these northern kingdoms, the rulers of former Qin were not Han Chinese. This state was ruled by people of the Di tribe of northern nomadic tribesmen, one of the so-called Wuhu, or five barbarians, who got all the credit for bringing down the western Qin and for causing one of the first waves of mass migration to the south of China of these northern Han Chinese, many of which later became known as the Hakka people. Well, come 383 AD, the former Qin emperor, he was determined to make a go at conquering eastern Qin and unifying China in the process. And when the battle drums started being beaten, the people in eastern Jin were wringing their hands and terrified at what was to come. Xie An, as prime minister, acted as a calm oasis in a storm, directing matters and though 
technically not a military man, he prepared for the defense of the capital, and this gave the people confidence. Even the military officers were having a bit of a freakout, but again, seeing Xie'an seemingly in control and almost indifferent at the dangers gave his men hope. And all lovers of Chinese military history know that everything led up to the Battle of Fei River, November 383. Former Qin made its move, and it's believed somewhere perhaps in Anhui, west of the capital Hefei, the famous Battle of Fei River went down, and the upshot was a victory for Eastern Jin. And so utterly complete was the Eastern Jin victory, the former Qin never recovered and didn't last much longer, falling in 394. The Eastern Jin, on the other hand, they lived on until the year 420, whereupon they got replaced by the Liu Song dynasty, first of the southern dynasties. So it's from this story that we get Dongshan Zai Qi, Xie An, who lived in Dongshan, East Mountain, present-day Shaoxing. He had reluctantly served in the government, but retired to a life of seclusion, and even took on the name Dongshan, Xie Dongshan. But after he retired from his service, he was called upon to serve China at a dangerous hour in its history. And for that comeback, after he had already retired, he is remembered in this Chinese saying, taken from the Book of Jin, that told how Dongshan, Xie'an's other name, Zai Qi, rose again. And for anyone who resigns or retires from the stage and makes a comeback, we can use this cheng yu of Dongshan Zai Qi, no matter politician, general, movie celebrity, like Robert Downey Jr., for example, a big star and part of the Brat Pack in the 1980s. He faded from the scene because of all his personal issues, but Dong Shan Zai Qi, he made a comeback and enjoyed a nice run in the Iron Man franchise of movies. Tony Bennett, too. Dong Shan Zai Qi, what a comeback he made in the 1990s. America's sixth president, John Quincy Adams, after serving in the hot seat from 1825 to 1829, came back a dozen years later to serve brilliantly as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Dong Shan Zai Qi. Hey, how about Dick Nixon? After the 1962 presidential election, he declared he wouldn't have Nixon to kick around anymore. But Dong Shan Zai Qi, he made a great comeback and later went on to become the 36th president. After the failed Gallipoli campaign in 1915, Winston Churchill's career was finished at the age of 40, but Dong Shan Zai Qi, he rose again in 1940 and went on to become one of the great men of history. You don't have to be famous or a historical figure. Any one of us, when it's seemingly all over for you, but later you rise again and make a comeback in your career or in your personal life, Dong Shan Zai Qi. Okay, this one ran a little long, but don't hold it against me, I beg you. Thanks to Emma once again, pulling through for all of us, behind the scenes. From the city of L.A. and the El Dorado State, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off, wishing you a fond farewell, and asking you once again to come back next time for another alluring episode of the Chinese Sayings Podcast.